All right, good morning, everyone. All right, it's good to be back. Uh, the first song we're going to open up with is called Let God Arise. So if you'd please stand and join us, and it's a really simple, it's a fun song, Let God Arise. That's right, Let God Arise. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Let the holy roar of God resound Watch the waters pop before us now Come and see what He has done for us Tell the world of His great love Our God is a God who saves Yes, our God is a God who saves let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. And His enemies will run for sure. And the church will stand, she will endure. Cause he holds the keys to life, our Lord, death has no sting, no fine, no word, our God is a God who saves, yes, our God is a God who saves, let God arise, let God arise, our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Father, we thank you for giving us this day today, for waking us up again, for us getting here safely to meet here. Uh, Father, all of our worries, our concerns, problems in our lives, uh, Father, as we walk through the doors today, we ask that we be able to let those down and for this next hour be able to focus on you and worship you and hear the word that you have uh, prepared for us uh, that Josiah will speak later. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, our hearts be open to the message, that our minds be open to what you have to say, and that we are convicted and transformed uh, by your Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, uh, I thank you, and we love you. And all the people said, Amen. You're not the only, we are all the same In need of mercy to be forgiven and be free It's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need And all the people said amen Whoa, oh, oh, and all the people said amen Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends And all the people said Amen If you're rich or poor, well it don't matter Weak or strong, you know that love is what we're after We're all broken, but we're all in this together God knows we stumble and fall and he so loved the world, he sent his son to save us all. And all the people said, Amen. Whoa, oh, oh, and all the people said, Amen. 
give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said, Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit who are torn apart. Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another start. For this is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said, Amen. Whoa, oh, oh, and all the people said, Amen. Woo! Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said, Amen. Yeah! And all the people said, Amen. Whoa, oh, oh, and all the people said, Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said, Amen. Silence. So far, we're off to a pretty loud start. And uh, you're going to need your Bibles ready because we are going to be flipping through quite a few passages today. But I asked you the question, what is silence? And we were all just sitting there quietly, and it was uh, kind of awkward and a little bit uncomfortable. That's probably what a lot of you think of when you think of, like, awkward silence or maybe even a little bit of darkness comes to mind or people that are quiet, maybe even... In, a mute person or something along those lines, but the definition of silence is the complete absence of sound. <clears throat> so why are we talking about silence? And what makes silence such a biblical and important subject? Well, let me show you a little bit. Let me give you an example. So you turn it up a little bit. So you hear this clicking? That is the sound of God's voice. It's quiet. It's kind of hard to hear. But things start coming into your life. Let's say, for example, sound, a song. This is a quite beautiful song by Beethoven called Silence, ironically. But other things start coming into your life, like gossip, the people of this world that are always talking to you, and it makes it a little harder to hear God. You already tell it's harder, it's getting distant. The traffic and the work life starts coming in and just blocking out, just adding to your Hi, life and advertisements wow. you'll be start saying, coming wow. into your Every life. All the things this of this tower, world it's like start shame. flooding in, it's like and it becomes harder and harder to hear God. Just listen. This one's wet or dry. We can't hear it at all. He's completely gone. So what we have to do now is we have to start fading these things out of our life. Get rid of the advertisements. Get rid of the things the world pushes on us. Leave your workplace. Leave traffic behind. Then it's just some people in your life, some music, but we, we're not quite there yet. Sooner or later we have to get rid of those people, we have to go be by ourselves, and you're left with just a few things between you and God. A song, something beautiful, just a little passion. That's not bad, but we're not quite there yet. Once we start fading that out of our life, we're just left with one single tick, something that helps guide us becomes something that can move us, something quite discernible. And that's the voice of God when we are by ourselves. That's what we strive for. That's why silence is important. So, turn your Bible to Habakkuk. And it's a hard book to find, so I'm going to give you some time to search. It's in the, near the second third of your Bible, near the New Testament. And while we're turning to Habakkuk, I want to talk to you a little bit more about silence. That's an interesting idea. Silence is a lot like zero. It's really hard to describe because it's absolutely nothing. But like silence, you can't know it unless you observe it. Or silence can't be known unless you observe it. You, by the very act of describing it, you're defeating the purpose of telling you what silence is. So you can't go very well around telling people what silence is, or can't really know in very the same way you can't know God by description. You can only know God by observation. And that's why it's important to be alone and to be silent with him. Now Habakkuk verse, or chapter 2, verse 20 reads, 
But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Now there's talk of silence in the Bible, New Testament, old all over the place. But this verse uh, shows us that it is important because God is in heaven. He's in his holy temple. I mean, he is transcendent. He's above us, but he's also eminent. I mean, he's here with us as well, but he's above us. He can see everything that is going on. He knows everything. He knows all the little details. He knows the hearts and men. And we are here on earth. We have limited knowledge. We have limited power. Don't you think we ought to listen to the being that is trying to help us out, guide us, and knows everything? That's exactly why it says, let all the earth be silent before him. Because he's just so powerful, so majestic, so beautiful, and he embodies love. And to talk and to be in the absence of something else with a person is disrespectful in our society. If I was sitting here trying to have a conversation with my dad, and I was texting while FaceTiming someone else, and there was music behind me, he'd probably get a little frustrated. So why do we ever treat God with the same disrespect that I wouldn't give to my father when he's the all-powerful creator of the universe? Turn with me to Ecclesiastes, verse 5. Proverbs, or Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, it's almost right in the middle of your Bible, and it talks a little more about this, the whole world being silent, how we need to approach God with respect and to listen. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 1. Guard your step as you go to the house of God, and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. The sacrifice of fools is a language that we don't hear very often. We understand go listening, but don't offer the sacrifice of fools. Well, what exactly is that? It parallels to what is spoken of in Proverbs and Psalms and other places in the Old Testament. But Psalms 1019 speaks very well on it. It reads, When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. So the sacrifice of fools is just a bunch of words. Um, in the New Testament, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, he's like, they are in bad prayers because they just go into public and they say many words to appear to be great. And in Psalms, it says, or in Proverbs, excuse me, it says that with many words, transgression is unavoidable. That's why in Ecclesiastes, it says, for they do not know they are doing evil. They come to God speaking all the time about everything. I'm sure we've done this all before where we just kind of sit there and we think and we talk to God, but we're not really having any purpose. This can be a little upsetting to God. And it shows that in Proverbs, and it also says here in Ecclesiastes that we need to draw near to God to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. In verse 2 of Ecclesiastes 5, it reads, Do not be hasty in word, or impulsive in thought, to bring up a matter in the presence of God. In the same way that I just said, we need to be respectful of who he is and the power he has, and we need to come with the intention of saying something meaningful to our Father, to have a real conversation with him, not to just go have some small talk or to just rant about our day or to ask him for a new Ferrari because those things aren't really important. So we need to come to him with the right mind, and the rest of verse 2 says, For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Once again, this just echoes the idea that this God that knows everything, this God that is so willing to help us out, to guide us, is in heaven. And he's looking down on us. And just based on that fact, we should be silent and listening to him. One of my favorite stories is in 1 Kings 19. Like I said, you're going to get your Bible workout today. We're going on an adventure. So 1 Kings is after 1 and 2 Samuel. It's after, there's at the beginning of your Bible, pretty much. It's a book we don't usually go to. But while you're turning there, let me introduce some of the characters to you. We're talking about a man named Elijah, who is a prophet of God, and a woman named Jezebel. I heard one boo hiss. Okay, I heard two boo hisses. Now, this is a story from ABC. Some of you probably aren't familiar with the boo hiss, but one of our professors, Bob Jones, every single time he says Ahab or Jezebel, because he, 
he hates them so much, he tells us to say boo hiss, and it's just ingrained in our minds. Anyway, so Jezebel is this evil queen of Israel. Judah and Israel had split at this point in history, and Jezebel was from a different land, and she came in and married Ahab, and she had brought with her false prophets and all these things that God despised. And Elijah had killed all her prophets, so she didn't like him very much either, and he was trying to dethrone her, so for obvious reasons, he feared his life of this very powerful and malicious queen. Now, if you read some of the other stories about Jezebel, she'll go to any lengths to do almost anything. So he fled for his life. He ran off into the wilderness, and the Bible, right here in the beginning of chapter 19, says that Elijah took shelter under the juniper tree in the wilderness. And there an angel came to him, gave him food and water, told him to rest. And from this nourishment, he spent 40 days a night traveling to the mountain of God, Mount Horeb. And that's where we find him in verse 9. Then he came to the cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of God came to him. And he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, Elijah wasn't very good at listening sometimes. And so God was trying to get his attention. And he says, and God says, hey, Elijah, you should go to the edge of the cave and I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to speak to you right there on the edge of the cave. So Elijah goes up to the edge of the cave, and he's standing there on the top of the mountain. He's looking out over the wilderness. And first of all, God sends this giant wind, this rushing wind, strong enough to tear apart the rocks in the mountains. I do believe that's in verse 10. A wind strong enough to tear apart a mountain. Can you imagine how strong that was? The strongest wind I've ever experienced in my life was when the hurricane came up through Ohio, that was like five or six years ago. I don't know. But I remember 2008. It was a long time ago. Seven years. So that was the strongest wind I ever experienced. But that is nowhere near how strong this wind was. Surely the God, the most powerful being in the universe, was speaking through this strong wind. But no, God was not in the wind. Well, maybe he was, but Elijah just wasn't listening, right? Perhaps. So maybe God tries to shake him up a little bit grab him by his feet, and shake him up. That's why he has an earthquake. At least, it had to be at least an eight on the Richter scale. I know that for a fact. I just have a feeling. So he's shaking him. It's moving the earth. The mountain is shaking. Can you imagine how terrifying that would be to be on top of a mountain during an earthquake? Surely, the most powerful being in the universe was in this moment, in the earthquake. But no, God was not in the earthquake. Perhaps maybe Elijah wasn't listening again. Maybe God was just trying to get a point across. So God sends a roaring fire, a fire that is so loud and consuming that it's un, it, it, you can't not notice it. Have you ever been close to a fire, how loud, like a big fire, how loud, how hot it is? You can't even stand it. Surely the all-consuming fire that is Yahweh was in this fire before Elijah. But no, Yahweh was not in this fire. And I feel like God was setting up this moment all of this noise, the rushing wind, the sound of the earthquake, the roaring fire, to strip it all away. To leave Elijah in pure silence. And out of that silence, I can just imagine when it happened. Elijah standing outside the mountain, he goes, Elijah, what are you doing here? That silence allowed him to hear the most powerful being in the universe, not through a blowing wind, not through an earthquake, not through a roaring fire, but through a gentle blowing of the breeze, through a still small voice. We hear from this story that God doesn't always talk to us in these big ways. We hear these visions of these dreams, the times in the Bible where God just shows himself before man, but that's not usually how it goes. He usually speaks to us in our conscience, in our prayer time when we are alone with him. Now, I don't know about you, but I take Jesus to be a pretty good example for how we're supposed to live our lives. I would think we all agree on that point. He's a pretty good teacher. So we're going to go see how Jesus treats God and how he spends his time. Now, turn with me to Luke 5. If you split your Bible in half and then split the second half in half, you'll be pretty close to Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's the third book of the New Testament. Luke chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 12. 
While he was in one of the cities, verse 12, Jesus, he was in one of the cities. Behold, there was a man covered in leprosy. Leprosy is another one of those funny things that not everybody knows about. It's a skin disease that causes boils and it's really nasty and spreads pretty easily. And so because it spreads so easily, you get outcast from society. You're forced to be in a leper colony. And so this leper man, who's not supposed to mingle with the people who are infected, came up and saw Jesus and fell on his face and asked him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He knew Jesus. He had the faith. And so Jesus was like, I am willing. And he heals him, and he cleans him of his leprosy. And he says in verse 14, he ordered them not to tell anyone. He just wanted him to go to the Pharisees, get approved by the Pharisees to come back into society and be on his merry way. But let's say, for example, you were healed from a disease that caused you to be strict, stricken from society, outcast from your friends, and outcast from your family almost your entire life. I think you'd be pretty happy too. So he was running around and he was telling everybody. And the word about Jesus started to spread all over the area. And eventually, in verse 15, news spread about him. Even further, in large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. All these people knew who Jesus was. His reputation was starting to build up. And after this healing, he was uh, so popular that everybody showed up to where he was staying. And what did Jesus do when he had this perfect opportunity with this large crowd to heal people and uh, to preach the gospel, to tell them about God, to tell them about who he was? What did he do? Did he do any of that? No. He slipped away into the wilderness to pray. That's strange. Don't you think that he would take an opportunity like this that we see as a perfect opportunity to do what he was sent here to do? He says in verse 16, but Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. He made it quite a normal habit of this, apparently. I can just imagine the disciples, they're walking down the street and Jesus is following them, and then all these people start showing up, and in the business of the crowd, they look around for Jesus and he's gone. Dang it, Jesus, he <laughs> slipped away again. Peter, where did he go? I don't know, James, I don't know. But he would do this all the time because he valued being alone, which is in the wilderness, and praying to God. Let's see another example of what Jesus did. Turn with me one book back to Mark, Matthew, Mark, and we're going to start on chapter 1. So in this story, there's uh, some disciples that had a sick, or uh, Simon's, particularly, mother-in-law was sick. And we're going to start in verse 29. So, or 30, excuse me. Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. So they came to Jesus with uh, Simon's mother-in-law, and he saw that she was sick, and he healed her. And so she was waiting there, and Jesus was waiting there, and eventually these disciples started bringing uh, to him, to Jesus, all who were ill, in verse 32, all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. Verse 33. Okay, well, for example, let me give you, say let's Nate Massey was healing someone. Let's say someone had terminal cancer in here, and Nate Massey healed them. And that person went and told some people, and they told some people. And the next thing you know, Tuesday morning, the entire city of Springfield is on Nathan's front door. He's, they're waiting there to be healed. They're waiting there to see who Nathan is. Do you think you'd be a little overwhelmed, Nathan? Yeah, I would be overwhelmed too. The, it says in verse 33, the whole city gathered at his door. The entire city was in front of Jesus. And he healed them. He, he healed the ill with various disease, of various diseases. And he cast out demons. He was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. He was working all night long. Remember, Simon Peter's, I don't know if I mentioned this, but Simon Peter's mother-in-law was brought to him in the evening when it was starting to get late, probably like 6 o'clock, you know? It was starting to get dark a little bit. They brought him, and then the people started showing up to his house. He was exercising demons. He was healing the sick. I'm sure he was preaching a little bit all night long. And in the early morning, while it was still dark, verse 35, what do you think Jesus did? Did he sit down for a snack? Did he say, disciples, leave me alone. I'm going to go catch some shut-eye. No, he didn't do any of that. He got up and left the house and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. So he'd been working all night long, doing all this exhausting work, being who Jesus was, 
And what's the first thing he did? He didn't go to sleep. He didn't go to eat. He went to go rest. But not in the way we think. He went to go rest with the Lord. Because that's where he knew he drew his energy. That's where he knew that he could be sustained and regenerated. It was in the silence. In the secluded place, he was praying there. So he went away to be by himself, to pray, to be silent with God. Because he knew that's what he needed to do. One more example. In Matthew 14, one book back again. We're just moving farther and farther back. In Matthew 14, we're going to start in verse 14 once you get there. Well, I'm just going to preface this a little bit. This is the uh, story of the feeding of the 5,000. <clears> and in verse 14, it says, Jesus saw a large crowd and felt compassion on them. He was on the boat, and he saw a large crowd on the shore. And so he went to them, and he began healing their sick. And he gathered more and more people around. Everybody was coming to see him. Now there's 5,000 men there. Not excluding the women and the children. So I think it's safe to say there's at least 10,000 people here. That's a lot of people. And it was starting to get late. Jesus was healing people. The disciples came up to him and they said, Jesus, I think it's time to send all these folks home. It's starting to get late. I think they're starting to get hungry and we just need to send them back into town. And Jesus was like, why don't we just feed them? <laughs> and I can imagine the disciples sitting there with, next to Jesus and looking over a crowd of 10,000 people and they look down and they only have five loaves and two fish. And they're like, Jesus, where are we even going to find enough food for these people, let alone have money to buy it? And Jesus is like, you guys know nothing. Come on. Ye of little faith, I am Jesus. And so he blesses the food. They pass it out. They have 12 baskets full of leftovers. Okay? All these people are fed. A miracle, one of the largest miracles in the Bible has just been performed by Jesus. And Jesus is just saying, and in 23, verse 23, he sent the crowds away. After he sent the disciples away, he sent the crowds away. And the disciples are on a boat heading across the sea, and the crowds went back to their homes. In verse 23, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And then when it was evening, he was there alone. So again, after a miracle, after he's been, and, and Mark, he's healed all these people. In chapter 5, he had just healed a leper, and everybody was gathering around him. What does he do? He doesn't sit there, preach, or go take a nap. He doesn't get some food. He doesn't do the things that we normally do to rest. He goes and be, be's alone. He goes to be alone with God, to be silent. To be in prayer and communion with him. We always need to keep in mind that in the silence, the quietest things become loud. Repeat with me. In the silence, the quietest things become loud. Yeah, I like participation. That's nice. You all get an A plus today. Except you, John. Just kidding. <laughs> so, we talked a little bit about silence. But that's, like I've said, it's kind of an obscure term. A little bit. We understand what silence is, but we need to help, to help us enact our silence better, we need to understand what silence is a little bit better. So I've broke it down into three categories. And as one of my favorite professors says, if you haven't taken notes, now's a good time to start. So if you're into that kind of thing, you can start writing it down. The first way to start, or the first way to enact silence is what I call a physical silence. And that is fasting. And that's not just from food. You know, we, we stray away from food sometimes to help dedicate ourselves to the task at hand. But I'm talking about anything that's physically in, influencing you, um, the desires of the flesh, like food, maybe it's watching Netflix, or texting, or talking to your friends, or watching TV, just on your cell phones in general, playing Call of Duty Black Ops 3 until 3 in the morning. And I don't have that problem, though. Some of you might. <laughs> but <laughs> that's the physical silence, the fasting. Now, there's mental silence. This is number two. And that's meditation. Now, a lot of people, when they think of meditation, think of like an Eastern religion type of meditation where they try to clear their mind of everything and become one with the universe, blah, 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 kind of crap stuff. Anyway, sorry, excuse my French, but that's not what meditation really is. It is focusing 
your mind on one particular thing, and that is God. It is clearing everything else out of your mind and focusing on one is making yourself mentally sharp. So that is mental silence. And then there's worldly silence. And now this is what we think of like, this is what kind of what I, how I describe audible silence. It's literally moving yourself from one place to another to be away from people, to be away from the distractions, from the cars, from your cell phone, turn it off, throw it in the pond, whatever you gotta do. You literally gotta move yourself sometimes to a place where people aren't, where distractions are, to be worldly silent. That is isolation. Before we move on, I want to talk about, I want to sum up three points of what we've talked about so far. One, that God speaks quietly. Sometimes he speaks to us in a great vision where he comes and a voice from heaven yells down. That only happened a couple times, or once really, twice. But so God doesn't normally speak in those ways. He speaks quietly. Number two, Jesus is the best teacher, and that's not the point, but I'm just prefacing. Jesus is one of the best teachers in the Bible, the best if not. And what did he do? He isolated himself to pray. We have to follow Jesus' instructions. We have to talk, we have to walk, we have to be like Jesus in every way we can. And that means that we need to isolate ourselves sometimes to be alone with God. And number three, we learned about what silence really is. We have described it in those three ways. The, I'll repeat them. The physical silence, like fasting, getting away from the desires of the flesh, mental silence, and meditation, a sharpening of your mind to focus on one particular thing. In this case, it is God's voice to hear God, to be with God. And number three, worldly silence, the isolation, the physical location from when you're trying to get away from things. And finally, how do we apply these things to our life? How do we find silence how do we make these things pertinent to our everyday walk? Well, one, we need to rest after a spiritually exhausting, physically, mentally exhausting event, because that's what Jesus did, but not in the way that we normally think. I've already said that resting is not what we normally think of, like sleeping or eating or recuperating or sitting on the couch watching a TV show on Netflix or something. But it is resting with God is being alone with God. So we need to make that our top priority. Our first thought when we get tired, when we get exhausted, is to not do anything else, but is to be with God. We need to take time out of our busy days to isolate ourselves for prayer. Jesus did it all the time. In Luke 5, we see that he made a habit of it. I can always imagine Peter walking upstairs where Jesus was supposed to be sleeping. He knocks on the door. Jesus, Jesus! There's 500 people standing outside our door right now, and they want to see you. Jesus! And then he doesn't answer. He opens the door, and he walks in, and there's bed sheets tied to the bed, and he's, they're hanging out the window, and Jesus is gone. And he yells down the steps, Guys, Jesus is gone again. I don't know what you do. Just give them some fish and bread, I guess. But can you imagine how frustrating it would have been? They didn't understand what Jesus did a lot of times. But we, in hindsight, know that it was to be alone with God. We also need to be silent before we make any big decisions. In the garden before Jesus was crucified, one of the most testing times of his life, he went to the garden in the silence of the garden in the cool of the night. He prayed his most passionate prayers to God. Now, his disciples were there, kind of. They were sleeping. And he tried to get them to stay up, but they wouldn't. So he was there pretty much alone, and he was there trying to make a big decision. And so we need to do that before we do anything in our lives. We need to spend some time to fast, to meditate, to move ourselves from this busy life in order to be alone, to pray, and to hear God's guiding voice on the subject at hand. Now, I want to make a point not to say that it's important that you hear me the right way, because being silent is not the only way to pray to God. You know, you can pray to him in your day-to-day life. Like a normal person, you can go someplace special and talk with him, or you can just talk to him on your normal day-to-day life. It's not like God only listens to you if you go to the wilderness, seclude yourself, and fast. That's not the point. What I'm saying is that we need to make a habit of that on occasion, because it is what Jesus did. It is what the Old Testament preaches and teaches us. I mean, 
Yes, God will answer you in, in weird ways throughout the day. You can pray to him anytime. He's always there to hear and help you. He is our father figure. But sometimes we just need to go with the, the respect and the intention of talking to the most powerful, majestic, loving, all-knowing being in the universe deserves. I like to make goals. I'm sure some of you like to make goals too. That's just how people work usually. Some people like to set their goals really low because if they don't make them or if they shoot a little bit higher, they, they like it. So uh, this is not a huge goal. I think we can all accomplish this for the next week. I know, an entire week. I don't want us to dedicate one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a whole 10 minutes out of our busy schedules to being alone during the busiest part of our day. It's uh, really hard for me. I know when I was working at Starbucks back in Georgia, that was in between class and work. I had like 40 minutes to make food, get dressed, to get prepared for work. So maybe one of those times I should have just stopped and not eaten a meal, skipped my meal, and spent that time meditating. I know for me now in school, it, the busiest times are when I'm trying to write a paper, trying to get a project done for Cornerstone, which is the church down in Georgia that I work for, and I'm trying to do all my homework, and I'm trying to figure out how to hang out with my friends all at the same time. And for you, it's probably work, trying to get assignments in, or, or late nights, or trying to spend some time with the family. You know, all these things are not necessarily bad, but they are busy. And our life today is just filled with a whole bunch of busyness, and not a lot of it is actually useful. So during our busiest times of the day, I say that we should take 10 minutes, strive to take 10 minutes, to go isolate ourselves. If you have to go to a closet, someplace, go sit in your car where you can just be alone and pray in silence. Now, I want you to repeat after me again. It is only in silence that the quietest things become loud. So we have a goal. We know what silence is. We know how Jesus applied it. We know how the Old Testament applied it. And silence is something that can't be described. It can only be observed. It can only be known by observation. And God is the same way. People can tell you everything about God. You can read about him in the Bible, which is great. But the only way that God can be truly known is by observation. Never forget the power of silence. Thank you.